عندما تعصف الرياح ومع مرور الزمن تظهر أحد أعظم معجزات الطبيعة المعمارية من تحت الرمال وردة الصحراء ومثل ما تكونت وردة الصحراء كذلك تشكل تاريخ قطر وتراثها حول رمال الصحراء ومياه البحر تم توثيق العصر الذهبي من تاريخ بلادنا في القصر القديم للشيخ عبد الله بن جاسم الثاني اللي تم تحويله الى متحف قطر الوطني في عام 1975 احتضنت التنمية والحداثة تاريخنا فتشكل مشروع فني جديد في شكل وردة الصحراء وهو متحف قطر الوطني الجديد Please welcome back to the stage Robin Pogrebin together with Her Excellency Sheikha Al Mayasa bin Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, Elizabeth Diller, and Daniel H. Weiss. Welcome to my esteemed panelists. <laughs> it's great to be here with all of you, Your Excellency, Liz, and Dan. Um, let's start with you, uh, Your Excellency. With this uh, conference in its earlier iteration had taken place on your turf, and you have created many uh, impressive museums there, um, including the <coughs> Museum of Islamic Art by, designed by I.M. Pei, and the National Museum of Qatar, which we just saw um, a glimpse of, and designed by Jean Nouvel. And when I was last there, um, I was uh, lucky enough to be given a tour of that museum by Jean Nouvel. Um, and he, at the time, they said it's almost finished. Um, it still isn't. Can you talk about you know, what is involved with a project like that? Why it isn't done? Is it just the scope is huge? Is it money? Is it a famous architect? What are, what are the challenges? <laughs> Um, I think with the National Museum, we've been always reluctant to announce an opening date um, just because of the complexity of the museum. Uh, it's finished in terms of building. The construction is complete. The collection is in place. Uh, the museum speaks about Qatar, so it's uh, the past, the present, and the future. We've also invited uh, filmmakers and contemporary artists to create site-specific experiences for our get visitors, both local audiences and international. So in terms of an opening day, I always feel like this was discussed yesterday about this colonial element of small countries or new countries uh, developing their own culture projects. If a museum in the West is delayed, nobody really talks about it or cares. <laughs> the moment a museum in the Middle East is delayed, it's frontline headlines, you know, front page headlines. So for us, we want to make sure that we open it correctly as opposed to opening it on a day that we have previously announced. So we're not... Um, we're not challenged by the idea of reflecting on our project and deciding when, when to really open it. I think <coughs> currently we're looking at opening the building in March of 19, so from December to March is not really that much of a delay. Uh, I know in Berlin, for example, they have this amazing project that still <laughs> no, you know, hasn't even started, you know, and no one's talking about it. So, um, but so how involved are you in the kind of the curating of what's actually going to go in it, talking about installations or programming? You know, 
I'm not an expert in any area of art history. I didn't study art history. I can't take any real credit for any project aside from working in collaboration with my colleagues. So in terms of collecting or curating, it's a two-way discussion with the curators that we have. The <clears throat> Museum of Islamic Art, which you uh, just mentioned, was a project I inherited, and it was a great collector who recently passed away, Sheikh Saud bin Mohammed and um, my father, who decided at that time they wanted to create one of the best collections of Islamic art. So he, he, those, those two men were actually the driving force behind the Museum of Islamic Art. I'm just um, taking a lot of the credit from the accomplishment of the Museum of Islamic Art. But one of the things we are very proud of is the building of our audiences. We've, if you come to the museum any day or any day of the week, any time or day, <clears throat> it's busy and it's busy with local families. And that's really something we're very proud of. Dan, when you came on board at the Met, um, you had you know, quite a job ahead of you in terms of getting a, a formidable institution back into financial shape, which you've made great strides towards doing. And part of that was having to make some tough decisions about this new wing for modern and contemporary art. Talk about that decision to put it on the back burner and give us a sense of where you are now in the evolution of that project. Well, the Metropolitan went through a process of careful review of our facilities and developed a master plan about five or six years ago. And within that plan, we identified a whole lot of deferred maintenance issues that had to be addressed that had built over the course of five decades. I'm talking about over $800 million worth of deferred maintenance. So that issue had to be addressed, and we needed a plan to deal with what we already had and the consequence of expansion over the course of the last five decades. That was very extensive. The other part of that was what was the vision for the future and what would be the next major project for us. And within that discussion that the board held with Tom Campbell and the staff, they identified, I think quite appropriately, we needed to address better space for modern art, modern and contemporary art. The facilities we have now are not worthy of the rest of the metropolitan. The space is not really adequate for how we use it. It's not substantial enough for our existing collection. And it has all kinds of infrastructure problems. So it was the right thing to do. The project as it evolved and when I arrived had become very ambitious. So I think one of the lessons in this discussion is what does it take to actually produce an expansion project? One has to be as thoughtful and focused about priorities to be a good client for the architect and for ourselves. And I think when we began this project several years ago, we had lots of good ideas. That's great. Lots of good ideas are, are certainly important in developing a plan. But if you have too many of them, the project gets increasingly complex, increasingly expensive, increasingly unwieldy. And we recognized that we had something really powerful and important. But at that time, because of the other financial challenges we faced, we put it on hold. And we tabled it to reflect on these other things. We've now done that. Our budgets are now in order. We have a very good plan to a balanced budget. The institution is strong and healthy. And we're back to that priority. So the state of the work is we've been working with David Chipperfield throughout this process, a wonderful architect and a great partner, and we now are shaping a vision that's more focused, more thoughtful, and stronger, we think, than the last one, which we'll be developing with our board in the, in the coming year. And I'm very optimistic we're on a really good path. And do you think that maybe the order in which it was announced, I mean, that was one of the things I sensed is maybe a lesson for all of us in terms of getting ahead of yourselves, which has to also do with maybe announcing an opening date, which we, as the press, we are always craving these details. How much is it going to cost? When is it going to open? Yeah. How long will it take? But those are often moving targets. But to sort of say this is a $600 million project before you had any money in hand, perhaps, was not the best order of business, would you say? There are probably other ways to proceed. Um, I agree. And even for us, raising that kind of money is, is an extraordinarily ambitious project. And so I think to do this the right way, one has to have the right project for the right reasons. They have to be defensible and compelling. One has to think carefully about all of the costs associated with this, not just the capital, but the operating costs and the deferred maintenance and everything that goes with that and then have a fundraising plan that's exciting for donors and have reasonable confidence we're going to get there. So you put all that together, then we make the announcement. So this is not the announcement. That <laughs> comes next year. Liz, um, MoMA has often come under criticism for 
years for being expansionist, taking over the world, taking over the block, certainly, um, and, and somewhat overly corporate, and the decision to take down the former folk art museum building had its own controversy. How much do you find yourself having to defend this project, its logic, the reason for it, and your participation in it? Wow, I thought I went through that like many years ago. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, I feel it's totally defensible. And I took on the project, my studio took it on, um, because we knew that MoMA uh, really, really needed to uh, transform. It needed to change in many ways. It needed to um, expand to show uh, more of its collection, because a lot of its collection is uh, behind closed doors. So that was a primary motivation. Um, Secondly, um, its interface with the city was really um, not very good. Um, it could stand for a lot of uh, uh, um, improvement. And as a citizen of, of New York and as a museum goer, I really wanted, you know, greedily to make a better place for me to go to. Um, and, and, and like many people who live in New York and who experienced um, MoMA for a long time, um, one has those recollections about uh, the pre-Tanaguchi uh, and the pre Cesar Pelli, what MoMA used to be, well, that could never happen again. We could never restore that, but how could MoMA be better in its current uh, manifestation and how could it be uh, uh, more ability to show more work in better ways, in deeper ways, a whole variety of work, uh, things that it was not, not able to show because of limitations. So, you know, I, I've been doing this with all my heart um, and, uh, you know, full belief that the project is going to um, be a, a big improvement. When you talk about interface with the city, t mm -hmm. say what you mean by that and what, what hasn't worked, what are you trying to improve upon? Uh, in the last manifestation, uh, the, the best space that, that, that MoMA has is the sculpture garden on, on the ground floor and that's what everybody loves and, and remembers. The actual entrance from 53rd Street is um, with, a, with a tunnel. I mean, it's one of the less uh, fortunate things that uh, came out of the Tan Tanaguchi, which, you know, has some very nice attributes to it. The entrance is not one of them. Um, and uh, <coughs> it's quite confusing, long lines. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to know really how to navigate. Um, and there's not really, and, and there's a big retail presence right uh, on the edge of the street. I, I just, all the things that are there are not um, necessarily uh, uh, what marks a good civic building necessarily. And, and congestion is, has been an issue. Congestion. Con congestion is an issue. Um, not being able to distribute uh, the public. Now, MoMA has become so incredibly popular, you know, and so. Um, so how do you, what, do you, what do you do with that? Um, well, one thing is just, just to navigate the space better, distribute people better, and, and, and give more space and more air uh, to the, to, uh, and, and also in between spaces, not just uh, expanding the galleries, but in between. Um, so I, what, what we tried to do was make the ground floor um, sort of free. There's a, um, a couple galleries on the ground floor now, um, which used to be, the project's uh, uh, space used to be there, and now there's something like that, and there's also another gallery on the ground floor. And, and also just uh, uh, fix some of the housekeeping issues, which really clog the way, ticketing and coats and all of that, those re really unsexy things that architects have to deal with. Um, and, and just produce a little bit more air and space and decongest, uh, decongest it and make a more, um, sort of a, just a better presence at mm -hmm. the edge of the street and more right. open, and transparent. Welcoming. Yeah. There, you know, in, in covering architecture over the years, which I have, you know, the Bilbao effect is often a term that now we use and feel somewhat hackneyed, but there is this sense of making a museum a destination, now, something the Met doesn't necessarily need to worry about, but your Excellency, you have achieved that in Qatar, where suddenly people ha might get on a plane to see art in you know, your home um, destination. And to what extent is that a burden? To what extent is it dependent on you? Um, because you have championed art there, and you have championed these projects, but they feel very much bound up with who you are and what you care about. I'm always happy to receive people. 
so it's no burden at all. But can it outlive you? Will people keep coming there for art? Um, let's it, say you do relocate to New York in a permanent way. You know, um, for us, when we started with our museum strategy and project, it was really a local project. It was for the local communities. It, was, it had an educational element. We had invested in education. We brought in university campuses. It was time to um, upgrade our cultural scene. So it was always about the local communities and the ripple effect of, I mean, we had one week after the opening of the Islamic Museum of Islamic Art, we had people, celebrities from different parts of the world coming to our museum and we, people would be saying, this person is here, this person, we, we didn't even know they were there. They had just came by themselves, they were curious, they were interested to see what was happening in our parts of the world, they were interested in Islamic art, they were interested in our textile collection, so they just came and we were very happy that they came to see things for themselves, we didn't really have to promote it or make that effort ourselves. Um, I think art is a universal language, culture brings people together and I don't see how that can ever change. You still visit Florence, let's say, or different parts of the world where culture or heritage has always historically or even more recently has played an important role in the development of their country. Did you want that for Doha? Was that sort of a vision of yours? No, our, our, our vision was not culture as a tourism element. That was the, not the main drive. Obviously, our tourism uh, authority does use our cultural components in promoting the city naturally, but the main uh, motivation and goal was to preserve our culture and heritage. If you look at the uh, trajectory of our plans. We had the opening of the Islamic Art Museum. We then opened the Arab Museum of Modern Art. And now we're opening the National Museum, followed by the Sports Museum. So it's all about building our collections organically, thinking about what our country needs, how we could engage with our community, and create different narratives that also connects these museums together. So tourism, yes, it's great for our country, it's great for the visibility, but uh, really our uh, main drive was creating content for our local communities. Okay. There is the sense that the museum is changing so much. And I know in thinking about the shed, for example, Liz, which you've also des are designing, you have wanted flexibility to be paramount because we have no idea that even by the time it's finished, our culture keeps changing. Dan, you have less flexibility with your actual physical structure. But I noticed when you started charging admission, for example, for people from outside New York, you had these kind of roving people with almost iPads, ways for people to check in that felt kind of very forward thinking. It's something that I know Joanne Heiler, if she's still here from the Broad, has done. Um, you know, just sort of removing kind of the, the old, the old fashioned information desk. Are there other ways that you plan to sort of rethink the Met's physical site to the degree possible, or is that just a limitation that you, um, you don't really have a lot of, of wiggle room? Well, the building itself is both a great asset. It's an extraordinary center for art and for uh, the visitor's experience, but it's also a constraint because of the, what it is. When we did the admission policy change, we really recognized on the one hand, we had to address a declining revenue problem that was very serious. And at the same time, we thought, if we are going to adjust, change that policy, how do we think carefully about the visitor's experience in a holistic way, which is not something historically we have done. We have restaurants, we have gift shops, we have desks where you can get an acoustic guide, we have all these things, but we didn't really think about how the visitor engaged with all of them so we, we redesigned that experience, and one piece of that is what you're describing, and that is having visitors, representatives with iPads to help people. And kiosks. And kiosks, that also is true. So we have more of those, and those have helped. The next stage of the work is to redesign the Great Hall, which is an iconic space, so we can only redesign it in limited ways. And we have limited space there, so we want to use it more effectively than we do now. For example, we have two very large coat rooms, which are for 50 weeks a year, not very well used. Is there a better way for us to deal with that space and create opportunities for the public? The answer is yes, and we're thinking carefully about that. So ideally, we'll reconfigure that space more flexibly, but also in a way that's more thoughtful about the way people experience our building, because all of you may be familiar with the Met by having visited many, many times. But most of our visitors come for the first time, it's overwhelming. They don't know where to go, the signage isn't clear, they're not sure what they're supposed to do. 
Even the steps themselves are very intimidating. I once sat at the visitor services desk, at the information desk. I've done it more than once. But on that occasion, I was sitting there, and someone came in and said to me, um, can you tell me where I am? You know, we assume people know, but they don't always. So there's a lot we can do with the space we have. I mean, it's interesting so much of whenever I'm in talking to an architect about a new project, their talk about porosity and transparency and yeah. wanting to kind of remove barriers that make these feel like sort of um, ivory towers or, and the steps can be a real barrier in that way. Um, do you feel as, I mean, how are you going to make the Met feel like more of a museum of the people or to, to kind of build, to draw these new audiences? I know that matter to all museums in terms of, you know, diversity, youth, right. how it, do you physically pr project that? Well, it's, there, there are myriad things one can do, starting with making the place look physically more welcoming. For example, the first time we ever put a sign outside the building saying who we are was about five years ago. Up until that time, you just had to know that it was the Met. And so there are things that, like that that can be done just to make clear to people they're welcome to come. Programming, the configuration of the space, how people are treated, and the quality of our outreach are all ways in which we draw audiences. We've worked very hard in the last few years to engage the public and uh, members of our own community in New York. There are various parts of New York City that don't come to the Met very often. So we've been out into those communities. We've done more school programs. We know that if you can get people in the building once and give them a good experience, they're likely to come back. But that's the great barrier. So get them up the stairs, get them in the building, engage them in a positive way. And we have seen, as a result of that, the average age of our visitor is going down. The number of young people who are coming as a result of various programming initiatives is increasing. And our digital presence is helping as well. So I think you have to do all of those things well over time to see a difference. Liz, when we come to The Shed, which is yep. this project in New York that, um, that Liz has designed and is under construction, it's in Hudson Yards on the far west side. And what has struck me about this project is that usually you have a visionary who hires an architect. And there wasn't so much an institution yet. In a way, it's the building has come first. And so to some extent, you have really influenced the, the thinking about the programming, which is going to be visual art as well as performing art as well as events. Talk about how you approached the shed and how it's different from other projects perhaps you've done before. OK, but I, ju I just want to say to Dan that, that the steps in front of the Met are <laughs> one of the greatest um, urban assets New York has. So as an urbanist, I say that that's, you know, include, and low library as well. Those two sets of stairs go beyond what they're, we're supposed to do to lead to the rarefied domain of so, something else. Um, the really we're not changing that. Yeah, yeah make so sure you keep it. it. Yeah, keep the steps. Um, okay, so, so uh, the shed is a very unlikely story. Uh, there was a, a very large development uh, in Manhattan called Hudson Yards. Um, in which uh, uh, there was a, a piece of uh, land that was designated by the city as um, designated for culture, but there was really no one, this is 2008, uh, there was really no cultural institution specifically that it was going to be designated for. Um, so in response to an RFP that came from the city, um, what institution wants to expand? That's uh, a request for proposals. A request for proposals. Um, uh, any institution that wants to expand, any ideas about future institutions. Um, so what came forward, uh, we and David Rockwell, our, our, our friend, uh, sort of came up with this um, notion about um, what, well, New York has 1,200 cultural institutions already between theaters and, and museums and galleries and all sorts of things. Why does it need one more thing? Um, and we realized what New York really doesn't have, it doesn't have a purpose-built, flexible, contemporary visual and performing arts space that, um, or, or institution um, that, um, that actually brings performing and visual arts together and, and pop culture. Um, and so the closest maybe is the armory, which is adapted and a little harder to use. Uh, we put this idea forward, uh, the city uh, became interested and um, sort of helped us to uh, sort of crystallize our ideas. And then we were asked for a business plan for the project. And oh, well, what's, a, what's, a, what's a business plan? Anyway, so we um, helped the city through that. And there was, uh, there was some uh, backing. And the project 
uh, became more and more real, and uh, uh, the, uh, um, it, it, there was a board that was formed around it with Dan Doktorov as the head, and uh, uh, Alex Poots is now the artistic director. Um, and hiring up to about 90 people and opening next year. So it's real, and it was something that came really from someplace else. It wasn't the traditional, we have an idea about an institution, now let's make a building for it. It was an opportunity to think about an institution and a building together. And that's, you know, I think um, just coming back to the question about uh, flexibility, um, when we began to think about it, we said, well, what does art look like in the future? And the answer was, we have absolutely no clue. And let's, first of all, protect the real estate. Let's, let's occupy it. And then let's make a building that's mostly um, infrastructure, but beautiful in infrastructure. Uh, and it was, dis uh, it, it was uh, inspired by Cedric Price's um, Fun Palace, um, and, uh, which was unexecuted from a uh, building from the 60s. Um, but it, architecture is geofixed and is there forever. Mm -hmm. And then when you struggle with a problem, how do you make uh, a building for um, a moving target, basically, contemporary art and contemporary uh, innovative work, how do you not kill it? How do you allow things to come to life that you don't know what they are? So that was the struggle. Right, we'll see if you'll pull it off. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the questions you do hear about the shed is that same question you just addressed, why do we need another performance space? You've just made a good argument. Uh, Dan, one often hears we have MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Whitney. Why doesn't the Met just stick to what it does well and steer clear of modern and contemporary art? Why um, do you feel like that should be part of your agenda and why is it worth rethinking a whole space and spending a lot of time and effort to raise a huge amount of money to improve yeah. it? Well, I think what we are doing is sticking to what we do well, which is the Met is a comprehensive institution with 5,000 years of art. Our goal is to cover the planet and almost all the civilizations we can gather material for, including the ones around us out the window. And we have always been a contemporary institution. We were collecting John Singer Sargent when he was giving those things to us, and he was a contemporary artist. So if we were to not be engaged at all in the contemporary world, we would become more of a mausoleum than we are a museum that engages with the world. So that dynamic relationship is part of who we are. The question is, how do we manage that? And how contemporary, as it were, do we want to be? One advantage of being in the community we are with the Modern and the Whitney and Guggenheim and others is that we don't have to be a leading edge experimental institution. That isn't who we are. But to engage thoughtfully in collecting and exhibiting and studying work that is uh, contemporary and modern is related to our mission. It helps us build on our core collections. We can allow that work to connect to our historical focus and the curatorial excellence that we have, the diverse resources that are already there. When we do it well, that's really what we're doing. And so I think that's entirely appropriate, but it should be done in the proper scale. We don't want to lose sight of who we are. We are an institution that I've already described, and we therefore have responsibilities to build collections and all those scholarly programs and everything else across a two million square foot building with lots of people and lots of interest. I think our challenge is to hold that in balance, but at the same time, we have to remediate what is an inadequate museum space now. Our contemporary modern galleries are, uh, they're just not up to snuff. We're going to go to questions soon, but first, Your Excellency, you have uh, worked closely with a lot of architects. You have made architecture a priority for your projects. Um, I think it would be interesting, I mean, I'm certainly curious, and I know others are, why does, is, does design something that you've come to care about? Why is culture something that matters to you? How, what was the origin of that, and, and why is it something that you've um, prioritized? I think it came uh, as part of the mandate for our national vision 2030 that we want to invest in culture and the arts. And we had a very good experience with the IMP building, uh, the Museum of Islamic Art. I don't know how, much, how many of you know that it actually started as a bid. And I think we had seven or eight architects competing for the building, of which everything was rejected because it simply was not good enough for the ambition and vision for, of the country. So um, at that time, IMP was retired, and uh, my father paid him a visit to New York, and 
he's quite convincing and convinced him to explore the Islamic art world and build a museum um, of the scale that we have today. So I think it was very important in terms of making a statement. It wasn't, I mean, we had the museum already, we had the National Museum, but it was um, a very simple building. And I think it was putting our Islamic heritage, history and culture at the core of our identity and also celebrating it with the rest of the world in terms of um, achievements and the height of Islamic civilization. There are many um, successful stories to share with our audiences and I think we in many ways succeeded with the building of the Islamic Art Museum. And in the same way with Methaf, uh, we knew at one point we were going to build a building which we've just recently announced. Uh, the architects are Elemental and it's um, the uh, renovation of an art mill that was, I mean, a flower mill that we're now calling the art mill, but this is a temporary name, uh, which was built in 1982. Um, but before that, we wanted to build our audiences, so we renovated a school at Education City with the collection that we had collected for Arab artists, again, giving them a base and a platform, because at that time, there were not many uh, museums around the world showing Arab artists or giving them exhibitions, let alone in our region. I mean, one artist would have a show in Germany or the US, but not in his own country. So we, we really felt this was important for us to support artists from the Arab world. Um, and then when it came to the National Museum, John Novell was already engaged with us and uh, he had proposed a different building at that time, which we felt um, wasn't going to do the job that we really wanted. It wasn't going to, it was an underground building and he wanted, you know, it, was, it, it was a very different project than the one we have today. So um, I don't know if I answered your question exactly the way you had expected, but you know, it was natural. If you come to Education City, to me, it's one of the most interesting places in terms of architecture. We have, I think, two buildings by Arata Suzaki. We have, um, two buildings by Rem Koolhaas, of which the National Library would just open last year. So architecture is very much part of the um, development of our city. You worked with Jacques Herzog on something? We're working, it's a bit like the story of the Met. Um, we've been revising the project over and over, making sure that the galleries and the museum size is the one that we need. We're trying to be more focused for the collection that we have. Um, I know that everybody was invited tonight. We'll be talking briefly about the Orientalist Museum that Jack Herzog and Pierre de Maron uh, designed for us. We're still not in a position to start the project because we're still revising the galleries, the size, and the concept. Um, but I think that will be our next project once the sports museum opens in the end of next year. Okay. Questions? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, which has been basically telling everything you're doing in the physical world. And the word expansion, I, in the digital world, I would presume there is an expansion in the digital world. And I'm not necessarily talking about your tweets and your Facebook to bring people in the real world. Um, is there anything in expansion specifically, you know, for example, at the Met or for Matt Half that I, I was honored to see? when it opened and then when I saw all the collection, which when I go back to Doha, for example, I don't see it or very, only a bit, bits and pieces. Is there something in the digital world to be created for these hidden treasures, so to say, that we rarely see or not always and, and play with our other architects so like that you can have fun in the digital world also? Um, I think the, the MoMA recently digitized this whole collection. It's all available online. We're trying to achieve that. Um, I would say the best, for, in terms of Qatar Museum, our, our best platform at the moment is Google Art. If you go on Google Art, you'll find part of Methaf's collection, part of the Islamic art, and we recently included some parts of the National Museum collection. But that's definitely in our strategy to digitize the collection and make it available. The National Library has actually done an excellent job. They've digitized a lot of their books and their records, and they are doing that for us at the Islamic Art Museum for our manuscripts. But I do agree with you. I mean, we could do a lot more in the digital world. Yeah. 
I, I, I agree with you. A question in the back. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Okay, we're, the mic is coming. One of the institutions that I admire the most in Qatar, in Doha, is the fire station. Uh, in the multiple times that I have been visiting, I like the fresh air and the interaction between some classic modern figures and the local scenario. There is something new in the tower in the middle that inspires us to do something with. I would love to know when it started this project, how this baby, as some people say in Qatar, is the baby of uh, Sheikh al Mayasa. How it started, where you wanted to go, is what people say. And uh, tell us more about the fire station, please. Thank you. Um, the fire station was built in 1982 and it was the civil service building and they, had, they were moving out of the building and we knew that there will be a big park development in that area. So we spoke to the government and said if, if, you're, if the civil service are vacating this building, give it to us and we'll turn it to an artist and residence studio building and the government was very supportive. They gave us the building and um, so there's two buildings. There's the original building, which were the offices of the civil fire station, civil defense, civil service. And we turned that into 22 studios, of which we have 24 are residents. So anybody living in Qatar can apply for this residence. There's an independent jury. I have no influence or no say on who gets studios. And then we have other studios where we have artists working on certain projects for us that get space, like Wa'al Shoki, when he had his exhibition, he had a space to prepare for his exhibition, Dia Azawi and others. So, I mean, I think it was a very successful project because everybody had a connection to the building. Every child visited the building for, as a school trip or, you know, their parents living, uh, working there. So it was a very successful um, project. And now that the park is open, it's, it's a very vibrant space. And we have we built a new building to provide services for the artists. So there's a woodwork studio, there's a gallery that's opened, Al Marhia Gallery, that sells art, art, artists' work. So thank you for enjoying uh, the fire station, <laughs> and I hope you all get to experience it because it's really been a successful um, project that engages with our communities. Liz, it, it strikes me that since you, you designed uh, the redevelopment of Lincoln Center, and now you're doing MoMA, you're doing the shed, you did the High Line, um, you did the Broad, you've become kind of a go-to architect for cultural projects, <laughs> but you still do other things as well. What is it about cultural projects, if anything, that you can point to that is a through line or anything that's consistent among them in terms of what it asks of you as an architect? Mm. Well, I, I started off uh, not being an architect, so I was uh, very interested in uh, photography, painting, and film, and so I started off on the art world, um, and then performance, and then I um, took the right turn when I maybe should have taken the left. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of see my position being on both sides of the gallery wall and the theater wall as advantageous to understanding what the plight of the curator is, or of the uh, theater director, or uh, uh, you know any of the um, sort of support functions in, in these spaces, uh, and 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 what the plight of the artist is. So as an architect, I have a little bit of empathy, and uh, in a sense, for all the people on the other side, the people making the the, the work, and the people that are hosting it. Um, so. Um, being on both sides of the wall, now I'm making the walls themselves, which is really spooky. Um, it's, it, it is a kind of uh, a great privilege um, to sort of be empathetic to, to all sides and, and try to um, sort of m make sure that, you know, it's like dialing up the architectural voice. How strong does it need to be? It doesn't often and always need to be heroic. Sometimes it's surgical. Sometimes it's, um, you know, uh, planting a seed, and sometimes it's really ripping everything apart and blasting everything out. So, um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers that your answers question. That answers it. On that note of blasting it out, thank you. <laughs>